how, so here they are at heaven's kitchen table trying to figure out how do we get these people out of the old covenant system? I know what I'll do. I'll go down. I'll stand on the other side. I'll kill them. says, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So how are you blessed? Being in Christ. Being in Christ gives you the blessing. It's not based on law keeping. It's based on position. Being in Christ gives you the blessing now. But what if you do badly? Under the old system, you do bad and you are cursed. Under the new system, you do badly and you are forgiven. That's hard because a lot of us really want to keep some curses in our new covenant. <laughs> saying, are you saying no curses? I mean, can I keep a couple? I keep my kids in line. I just... there, there is now in the new covenant a curseless reality. If I can offer to you this, this shift, in the old way of understanding it, Jesus steps into humanity and he's the perfect law keeper. And as the first and only perfect law keeper, he creates something called the new covenant, sort of. And that idea, we then are, we are guilty, we are sinful, we are evil, and we are in this courtroom scenario. Remember the courtroom? And there the father's the judge, and you're on trial, and you're a murderer, and you're just the worst degenerate that's ever existed, and the father's going to pass sentence on you, except Jesus, your lawyer, comes in and says, I will take his position, I'll take his place, or her place, and I'll, I'll take the prison, or the beating, or the whatever, right? You guys have heard this? It's how some of us got saved, right? <laughs> So we hear this, this version of, of the presentation, and so we get to go free, and he stays and takes our place. Is this what you heard? Yeah. Okay. Did Jesus take your place? This, I, want, I want you to pause on this for a minute. Paul says we were crucified with Christ. Yet not I live, but Christ lives in me. He, saw, he, he says it several different passages. Galatians 2.20, Romans, he talks about it. And he talks about how we died with him. We got the story really wrong in the courtroom situation. Because he doesn't come in and take your place and say, there you go, now you're free. You degenerate who has not been regenerated in any way, and now you're free to go. No, instead, he actually steps into the reality. He grabs you with him and says, hey, we'll go to the cross together. If we both get crucified and I'm God, I'll bring us both out of the grave. And then you'll be a new creation. And then you will be uh, filled with grace and you'll have all these new things and you will die to the law. This, this is really different. But in Romans 6, it talks about that we're united with him in his death and we're united with him in his resurrection. See, you were not. Oh. Another thought here is the difference between forgiveness and punishment. Did God punish you or did he forgive you? Um, the, the, the challenging thought is that God took all of this wrath and anger and every, everything that had ever been done wrong and aimed all of that anger and wrath at Jesus on the cross. And by doing that, you were able to go free because that's, that's what we've been told, right? You didn't die on the cross. He died on the cross in your place. You should have died on the cross, but you didn't. You got to go free.
Colossians 2, verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So he forgave you. Do you believe God forgave you? Good. Do you also believe that God poured out punishment on Jesus at the cross? You don't have to say amen. Just say amen in your head because then I'll, I'll go there. Did he forgive what your legal indebtedness? Did he forgive it? Now, we're quoting Paul, so I agree with Paul. He forgave it. So if you forgive a criminal, a criminal is in your courtroom, and he's done all this horrible stuff, and you say, I cancel your legal indebtedness. I forgive you. You are free to go. Now go over to the execution chamber where we're going to kill you. <laughs> Got a challenge here, right? Let's say you, you go to your bank and they, they've sent you a letter that says, we have forgiven your debt. And you're like, wait, wait, wait. I've been paying on this mortgage for 30 years. Yeah, I got a letter that said that I paid off my mortgage. Now you're saying you forgave my mortgage? But I, no, you didn't forgive anything unless you're going to give me my money back. Forgiveness and punishment don't go together. It's either one or the other, and Scripture tells us we were forgiven. So what actually happens here, because our distorted law-centered salvation message is that Jesus came and he perfectly fulfilled the law, then he took all of your law breaking on himself, and he took the Father's beating, and you got to go free, you weren't actually died and resurrected, you just left the courtroom and still continue as an unnew creation, as an unregenerate, what actually happens is that Jesus comes out of heaven, stands on this side, creates a new covenant with his blood as the lamb sacrifice. They cut a new covenant deal, and it's called the new covenant of forgiveness at the Last Supper. He holds up the cup. This is the blood of my new covenant of forgiveness. The new covenant is a covenant of forgiveness. So they make a new covenant of forgiveness. And now when he goes to the cross the next day and he dies, you spiritually died with him in that moment. And three days later, when you come out of the grave, he comes out of the grave. You come out of the grave with him as a new creation people. That's actually what took place. It wasn't the father and the son and the father beating the son to death and letting you go free. So there's a few big pieces, few big nuggets here that you were involved in the whole thing. You died and resurrected, which is really good for you because also Paul makes this argument in Romans chapter seven and he says, how can a woman, how can a, a woman be married to two husbands? I don't know if you remember this one. How can a woman be married to two husbands? One has to die before the other one can be her husband. The first husband has to die. But Paul, he does something super weird in Romans 7. The old covenant and the new covenant are the two husbands. You get the picture. Follow me for a moment. Old covenant is one husband. How is she going to get married to the new husband? Well, the old covenant husband would have to die, normally speaking. But what Paul's argument actually is in Romans 7 is that you as the wife actually die and then come back to life, and now you're free of the old marriage because that woman who is married to that guy is dead. And then you come back to life as a new woman, and now you can remarry a new husband, which is the new covenant. So instead of the old husband dying, Paul goes, actually, you died. And then you come back and you can get married to the new husband, which is Christ. So you're no longer married to the old system. 
So you got free of the old covenant, not, not even just by the old covenant dying, but by you dying. You bypassed the whole system. How, so here they are at heaven's kitchen table trying to figure out how do we get these people out of the old covenant system? I know what I'll do. I'll go down. I'll stand on the other side. I'll kill them. <laughs> they will all die with me. I'll die. They'll die. We'll all die together. Everybody dies. And then I'll come back to life and bring them out of the grave with me into a whole new humanity. And we'll come out of it, and now they'll be free to actually live in this covenant of forgiveness with us, the Godhead family. But, you know, there's going to be a while where they probably still try to go back to the law. So we'll have to teach them about Ishmael and Isaac. We'll have to teach them about kicking out the slave woman and not being married to two husbands and not having the ministry of death and life. Don't have both in your life. And, and we're going to teach them it's the new is nothing like the old. And I mean, it might only take 2,000 years, but we will teach them to leave the old covenant behind. <laughs> If we, can, if we can really grab on to what, what has been created for us now, it is the most free thing that many of us have never tasted, this level of free. This, this level of free over here, you've come out, and you're not, you're not coming out of the grave as uh, uh, someone who is just a human. No, now you're a new creation. This has never existed before. This is regenerated. This is powered by grace. This is a whole different thing that's never been seen in the earth. It's a challenging thought, too. I, I try not to use the term Trinity most of the time. I mean, I know it's, it's normal for us. We, we use it, and we know what we're saying, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But the, the challenge, if you go a little further with this, and some people have gone into weird places, and that's not where we're going. But if you actually see what's going on here, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is a family. In the Scripture, it's not referred to as the Trinity. It's referred to as the Godhead. So you have the Godhead. These three, three persons that are one, and what are they doing? They're looking to get a bride for their son. Do you think that they want him to marry down? <laughs> this, is, this has been our idea of like, uh, you know, he's here, we're here, and he is looking for a, a trailer park bride to control. <laughs> We have this abusive picture in our mind of our marriage with Christ that I just want to be a robot. I just want him to control me. No, that's why he gave us the fruit of self-control. He wants powerful people to stand on the other side of this relationship with him. He wants a bride that can stand eye to eye. No spots, no wrinkles, no blemishes. She is perfect and beautiful and if he tells us not to be unequally yoked, will he be? That's why P Peter writes and says we are partakers of the divine nature. See, it's not just a trinity. The bride is the fourth person of the Godhead. When we talk about identity, we're talking about something much higher than many of us have really touched yet. It's way higher than what we're thinking. The identity of being a new creation and being the bride and being the army and being the ambassadors, it's put us on a level that we don't realize yet. And it's, it's not just a level of power or holiness or, or those things. It's actually also a level of relationship. You know, there isn't a bride that's like fearful to go talk to her husband. No, you have this open-hearted, passionate, connected relationship. And this is what we have available to us. It's what he offers 
at Mount Sinai, everybody in the nation will be a priest. Everybody gets to have direct access. He offers it there, and they aren't able to receive it. So instead of having a second rejection 1,400 years later, we're going to offer it to some other people, and then they'll probably mess it up too. He offers it to himself and creates something entirely new inside the Godhead, the new covenant. He makes it with himself and then makes it available to us. And we get to choose to step into it. There's this passage that's familiar to many of us about new wine and new wineskins. He says not to pour new wine into uh, old wineskins because they'll burst and they'll break and it'll be loss. Interestingly, and we don't get this in our English translations, he actually uses two different words for the word new in this passage. And it has huge implications for us. The words new, there were two different Greek words for new. There was kainos and there was neos, two different kinds of new. Now, uh, neos is actually a new but the same. If we went outside and I showed you a Ford Taurus uh, 2019, it would be new, but it would basically be the same. I mean, they're not going to say that, but you know, maybe a new button or something, but it's basically the same car as the 2018 Ford Taurus. It's Neos. And then the other word for new, Kanos, is like prototype new. Like if I took you out and showed you the uh, 3018 Ford Taurus, if I showed you that, it's something you've never seen. It flies, it goes underwater, it's got missiles. I mean, the whole deal. I mean, the luxury package. It's got missiles, you know? Sometimes trees get in the way. So, so you got Kanos new, which is like another planet new, prototype new, unseen ever before new. <laughs> So what does he say? He says that you need to pour new wine into new wineskins. He says you need to pour Neos wine into Kanos wineskins. What he's saying is the Holy Spirit, who's represented by the wine, is coming fresh, but he's still the same Holy Spirit. He's Neos wine but he gets poured into a wineskin that's Kanos, unlike anything ever seen before. A prototype wineskin that you have never seen before. This is what he's telling them when he says, hey, I can't pour the new wine into the old wineskin of the old covenant world because it's going to burst it and break it and it won't catch the new wine. So instead, I have to actually come and bring you a Kanos wineskin that I can pour my new wine into. Whenever he refers to the new covenant, in, in all throughout the whole New Testament, when you find new covenant, uh, there's this pattern of there's the old covenant and the new covenant is the Kanos covenant. It's not the same as the Mosaic Covenant, but a slight upgrade. It's like slightly new. No, it's something new like has never been seen before. That's what you see when you read it, when you see it in the Greek, is it's saying prototype covenant, prototype covenant, prototype covenant. Unlike anything, which is why Hebrews 8 says, unlike the one I made with your ancestors at Mount Sinai. Completely new and different. Um, we were talking over lunch uh, today about the kingdom realm and the new covenant realm, and I was explaining how when we hear the word kingdom in the New Testament, it is always referring to the, the covenant between David and God. David was promised a house uh, that would be an eternal throne, and he'd have a son that sits on an eternal throne. You remember? We talked about it last night. So he is promised the son that will sit on an eternal throne. He's promised a kingdom everlasting. So when we hear the phrase, the kingdom, it is the fulfillment of the promise to David. 
we see uh, blind Bartimaeus. Son of David, have mercy on me. He's yelling this as, as Jesus is walking by. Son of David, have mercy on me. He's calling on the covenant promised son. He's recognizing the covenant promise is walking by. He doesn't say Jesus, Savior, Messiah. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So he's recognizing, people understood this in the first century, and they are recognizing he is the fulfillment of these other covenants. So when you get to the, the kingdom, the kingdom is one part of the new covenant. It's train A has offloaded all of its goods onto the new covenant, and it keeps going. But there's also train B. There's Abraham. And Abraham has all these wonderful promises as well, and they get offloaded onto the new covenant train and continue. When we start to see that, what we start to understand is that the kingdom message is not the overarching message. It's a sub-message of the new covenant. The new covenant is bigger. It encompasses both the kingdom and the Abrahamic covenant promises. It's larger so the kingdom is a portion of the new covenant message. Those two trains, I just wanted to point out the difference, the subcategory of the kingdom, it, it doesn't cover everything. So there's more to it than just the one part. Now the other thing that we really want to focus on tonight is this third train. The third train, train C, the Moses train. What has been confused, and especially when you go through the dispensational mindset we were talking about earlier, the idea is that the train crashed at Matthew 1.1. The train did not crash at Matthew 1.1. The train actually continues throughout the New Testament. So, although it sounded like I had it real simple and clear for you, I'm now going to complicate it a little bit, but it actually is going to help you tremendously. So in this, in this train scenario, what happens is train C gets to Matthew 1.1, but it doesn't explode in Matthew 1.1. What happens is it continues, and Galatians 4.4 says that Jesus was a man born under the law. So he's born, and train C still exists. And when we get, to, um, uh, we get to John the Baptist, Jesus says of John the Baptist, he was the greatest of the old, but the least in the kingdom will be greater than he. And some people have said, okay, so when John the Baptist got his head cut off, that's the old covenant being removed, and the new covenant is being released. And they take that metaphor. Or they go to the Mount of Transfiguration. There's Jesus and, and the three, uh, J Peter, James, and John. And you have uh, Moses and Elijah show up on the mountain. You guys remember Mount of Transfiguration. And Peter, uh, oh, uh, let me make three tents. Let me make three uh, uh, buildings so that, so that we can all stay here. And then at that moment, the Father God speaks and interrupts. Peter, and says, this is my son, listen to him, and the other two are gone. So the law and the prophets, they disappear, and Jesus is there, and he says, listen to him, and some say, that's the transition point, and we move from the old to the new, and that's where we draw the line, or we get up to the cross. And you have at the cross, you have the, the death of Jesus, the creation of the new covenant. And some say, okay, that's the line. That's the line between the old and the new. Maybe it's the cross that train C gets to the cross and then it explodes. Hebrews chapter 8 tells us more clearly what happens with train C. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Now, the book of Hebrews is written in the late, late 60s A.D. 
That's important because it's not written in the 30s AD. It's written about 30 to 40-ish years after the cross. So here, all these years later, it's saying the new covenant made the old covenant obsolete. Obsolete and outdated and soon to fade away. That's a weird verse. That is very challenging thought right there because he's saying, look, it hasn't passed away yet. The train has not exploded. The new made the train C obsolete and outdated. That's why we tell you, throw out the slave woman. It's a ministry of death. The new is nothing like the old. Uh, The glory of the old has faded. You know, they give all of this stuff that's true because the new covenant train makes the old C train, the Moses train, obsolete and outdated. But it's soon to fade away. So if we could think of it this way, the train C, mosaic train, mosaic covenant train, had derailed at the cross. When the new was created, the old was made obsolete and outdated. And it derails and starts to go off course. And now the only people that are holding to the mosaic covenant, the train C code, are the Ishmaels the first century present Jerusalem that is persecuting the new covenant train. Persecuting, persecuting, persecuting for 40 years. 40 years until a few years after this book, Hebrews, was written, then the world, the entire world of the Mosaic Covenant, which is the temple, the priesthood, the city of Jerusalem, the first century system, gets annihilated by the Roman invasion. Train C blows up at 70 AD. Not at Matthew 1.1, not at the beheading of John, not at the Mount of Transfiguration, not at the cross, but it blows up at 70 AD and that world collapses. This is why even in Hebrews 13, he follows this thought a little bit further, and he says in verse 14, For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. There's a constant contrast between the present first century Jerusalem city that was not going to endure and the heavenly Jerusalem from above that was coming down which is representative of the New Covenant.